Welcome to worship for June 13th, 2021. I'm Bobby White, the guest preacher, and I greet you on behalf of John Hagman, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church here in beautiful Morganton. If you're joining us online for the first time or for the 40th time, we are so glad you're here. We want to connect and get to know you. So if you would take a moment and follow the link at the bottom of your screen to our website and click the button to connect with us, we'd love to hear from you, whether you are online or in person. Thanks for being part of our community of faith at First Presbyterian. And I pray that today you will be blessed. Today we are continuing our sermon series titled, God at Work. The people of Israel face challenging and chaotic times again and again. But God was still at work, sometimes subtly and other times not so subtly, providing leadership for the people and orchestrating a plan of redemption for God's people. Through this series, we will explore 1st and 2nd Samuel to see how God, God calls, God responds, God sees, God leads, God saves, and God unites. Over the last week, we have looked at how God has, is, and will be at work in the world. And we have looked at how God calls people and how God responds. Today, we look at how God sees. Today, we're introducing you to a young future King David, one of the most significant Old Testament people. David united the people of Israel and Judah. He built the nation. He conquered their enemies. He established a capital and worship center in Jerusalem. The stories of David are fascinating. David was a complicated man with strong emotions and passions. He weeps and he dances. He is a successful military commander and an unsuccessful father. He had a close relationship with God and yet he committed a horrible sin. His story could have made the New York Times best-selling list. He wrote many of the Psalms that we use in our worship they included Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd, and Psalm 139, the one we will use today as a call to worship. David's impact reached into the New Testament. According to the prophets, the Messiah, the Christ, was expected to be a descendant from King David. Both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke make a point to say that Jesus was descended from David. At times, Jesus was addressed as Son of David. At Palm Sunday, the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In today's New Testament reading, the blind man called Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Let us be called into worship using the words from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the depths of the earth, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the furthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, 
for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and for whom no secrets are hid, fill our hearts with your love by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may love you and our neighbors through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Gospel reading is from Luke 18, 35-43. Hear the word of God. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going, he asked what was happening. They said to him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then the blind man shouted, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. 
Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it, praise God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For God so loved the world that God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So with confidence in the love of God, let us confess our sins before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourself. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may be delighted in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who is in position to condemn? only Jesus Christ. And Jesus came down to live with us, died for us, rose for us, and prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since we've been forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The scripture that we're going to read from Samuel needs a little bit of introduction. Before reading the scripture, let's put it in context. Two weeks ago, we looked at God's call to Samuel a key player in this scripture as the prophet, priest, and leader. Then last Sunday, the people wanted a king. Rejecting God as their king, God responds by agreeing. A lot has happened in scripture between last week and this week. Since God agrees to a king, Samuel anoints Saul as the future king. Saul had a striking appearance, being at least a head taller than the other people. Saul was victorious when he led the people against some of their enemies and was recognized as king by the people. However, unfortunately, Saul did not do all the Lord commanded. For example, before a battle, Saul got tired of waiting for Samuel to come to offer the sacrifice to God for success against their enemies. So Saul offered the sacrifice himself. When Samuel arrived, he was not a happy camper. He condemned Saul's action and said, But now your kingdom will not continue, for the Lord has sought out a man after the Lord's own heart. The Lord appointed him to be ruler over the people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Let us pray before reading the scripture. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Reading the Old Testament scripture from Samuel 16, 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. 
Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to your sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name for you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peacefully. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And Samuel sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or on his height of statue, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Desi made Shema pass by. And Samuel said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And Jesse said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. Jesse sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward Samuel then set out and went to Ramah in the scripture Saul was still the king Samuel was afraid imagine if Saul found out that Samuel was going to anoint another person to be king there would be bloodshed but Samuel did as God had said when Samuel came to Bethlehem, the people were afraid. Samuel was a powerful man. Did he come on behalf of Saul or God to rebuke them? Did he come without Saul's knowledge, and could that get the Bethlehem people in trouble? Saul said he came peacefully. Samuel said he came for a sacrifice, and he sanctified Jesse's family and invited him to the sacrifice. He must have told Jesse that he wanted to anoint one of his sons, so Jesse had them come one by one before Samuel. When Samuel saw that Jesse saw Jesse's oldest son, something about him really impressed Samuel. Maybe he was tall like Saul or had a commanding personality. But God said to Samuel, he is not the one. Do not look at the outside. God said, I am not looking at the outside, but I see what's in a person's heart. God had already told Samuel that he would replace Saul with a man who had a heart after the Lord's own heart. So Samuel was discouraged that none of the sons were chosen by God. When he found out that there was one more, it sounded like that son was a nobody. He was the one watching the sheep, the youngest. Jesse didn't even believe he was important enough for him to come to witness uh, Samuel or to be part of the sacrifice. His name is not known in scripture until after Samuel anoints him. The family must have wondered why the youngest could be so important as they should not sit down until he came. When David arrived, God said he was the one to anoint and Samuel took out the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Did they understand why he was anointed? Did David really understand the implications of the anointing? Were others there? 
It does not tell us, but it says that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on David from that day forward forever. Samuel returned home. David filled with the Spirit and a new relationship with the Lord probably went back to his sheep. David was given the powerful spirit. We too have been given the Holy Spirit through our baptism. We have the power, the comfort, the encouragement, the challenge, and the closeness to God through the Spirit. Just like the Spirit helped David, so the Spirit helps us. Just like the Spirit gave energy and wisdom to David, so the Spirit fills us. Even though God called David and Samuel anointed David to be king, David didn't become king for a long time. Saul was still king. That is how God works sometimes. It is only when we look back at our lives and the world that we see God's in action. David experienced many things that prepared him to be king, but it was only after the death of Saul that David became king. As Presbyterians, we believe that God calls each of us to be disciples and servants, just like God called David to be king and Samuel to be the prophet and leader. We are called to be in relationship with God, who sees and demonstrates in our lives God's grace and love. Often we look back at our, our lives. It is easier to see how God has been working in our lives to change directions, to use old skills in a new way, to use friends and strangers to impact our lives. God sees differently from us. God had seen that Israel would need a new king. God was looking at the heart of the potential king. God told Samuel, he was looking for a person after God's own heart. In my old position as the General Presbyter of Western North Carolina, I had a chance to work with many pastor nominating committees who were searching for a pastor for their church. Calling a pastor has a few similarities with calling David. We believe that through prayer that God speaks to the pastor nominating committee. That is why we recommend that they must be unanimous. One of the stories from a pastor's search reminds me of this scripture. A member of one of the committees was concerned that they would call the wrong pastor. In a prayer, the member said to God that they felt this candidate was green behind the ears and too young and too inexperienced. They said they heard God say, yes, but that candidate is a person after my heart. Kind of biblical. The candidate turned out to be an incredible spiritual leader and pastor. Unfortunately, I've also worked with a pastor nominating committee that said even though they had signed the equal opportunity commitment, they wanted a tall white man, about 40, with a wife who taught school and two children. It was hard work to help that committee realize that they were limiting themselves to see as God sees and to know who God would like them to call. It would be like just limiting Samuel to the David's seven brothers and leaving David with the sheep. This committee finally realized that and they called a single woman who was an outstanding pastor for their church. When we choose pastors and elders and deacons and Sunday school teachers and mission team members and nursery workers, are we looking for a person with the heart for God? This challenges us in how we look at people. Do we pick the tall, handsome man? How do we own our preferences and prejudices and know, understand how they enter our thinking? Do looks or skin color or background or wealth or other issues impact our decisions? Do we try to see people through the eyes and the heart of God? God called David to the position of king and into a continued relationship with him. 
God saw and was present with David when David sought guidance in fighting battles with their enemies, when David committed unspeakable crimes, and when David asked for forgiveness. God saw and was present when David danced in praise of God and wept for his son in the good times and in the bad times. God continues to see and to work as God did during David's times in people's lives and in the world. Psalm 139, used in the call to worship, tells us how God sees us as we are. The psalm says that we are wonderfully made. Each of us is blessed with unique skills and gifts and with unique passion. God knows us. God knows what we think and what words will be on our tongue. God is acquainted with all of our ways. God sees our heart. There is nowhere where we can go and not be in God's presence or where God's right hand will not be available for us for guidance. God sees and God knows, which means God is present. That can be both scary and comforting. If I take it seriously, it can encourage me to learn to see with God's eyes and to grow into being a person of God's heart. Or as the Apostle Paul said, to grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. When I am so busy that I don't have time to listen, to share my thoughts with God, or to be present to God, then I am missing out on something incredibly special and am not growing in faith or in my heart. God sees and God loves. Knowing that can be comforting bring joy and energy, and help me listen to God's still voice. To know God is walking with me in the good and bad times is a way to get through the hard times. God sees and God loves. Knowing that helps me pray for people and places I love and churches and for the world. I am more aware of seeing ways that God is working in my life, the lives of those I know, the church, in the world. To each of us, God says, I see you, really you. I know you. I look into your heart. I love you and you are mine. I call you by name. Christ came to live among you, die and rose for you. Like with David, I desire to be in a relationship with you through the good and the bad. I also want you to grow toward a heart like mine, to grow in the likeness of Christ, for you are wonderfully made. Amen.
us prepare our hearts to give. We invite you to give your tithes and offerings online using the link in your screen or by mail, bring them to the church office. With gladness, let us present the offering of our life and labor to the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the many blessings and the way you walk with us. We pray that as we give this offering that we will grow in the likeness of Christ. We dedicate our lives as disciples of Christ and our money to be used in your kingdom. We pray that this offering may be used to help people learn of your love. And by our actions, we will demonstrate your love to the community and in the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, God who sees, God who loves, and God who acts, we thank you for caring for each one of us and for the world. We pray for those close to us, those with sickness, loneliness, fears, and other challenges. We pray Christ's healing touch on those and all those in need. We pray for this church, that as members we may grow in faith and in service. We pray for this community, its needs and its buried persons. We pray that we may see our church, our community, and our world with your eyes. We pray for the world and the many people that live in poverty, oppression, sickness, and hopelessness. We pray for a successful ending of the COVID pandemic. Particularly, we pray for Malawi and the USA. We pray for our president and his trip, and for our Congress and the government leaders, that they may hear your voice and act with wisdom, justice, mercy, and compassion. We pray for Christians in your church all over the world. May with boldness we proclaim the good news, protect the church members, and build up its witness by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, again, we give you thanks and praise, and we trust ourselves, the church, and the world into your loving arms. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Remember, God sees you, really you. God knows you and knows your heart. God loves you and calls you by name. Christ came to live among us, died for us, rose for us. Like with David, God desires to be in relationship with us through the good and the bad. God wants you and me to grow towards a heart like God's heart, to grow in the likeness of Christ, for you are wonderfully made. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia.